Sally. Hi, Sally. Does everybody know who that person is? Uh, Sally, Sally Mann, who I work with, Infused Performance. Hello, Sally. Uh, All right. Well, we'll probably start, um, John, by introducing a little bit, and then we can introduce each other. Um, but I think that, yes, it's going to be just Sally um, from Fuse that we have to introduce, oh, sure. uh, and Sheila as well. Um, right, OK, so um, I'll just start by saying thank you for joining us today. Um, it's quite exciting for John and I, because we've been working on the project of the Institute of Place for now a year, over a year, I think. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of uh, the first outcome is the website that we want to show you today. Um, and then we thought that it would be great to have a sort of uh, event conversation type uh, around notions of places. And uh, we've invited Gordon to come and talk about his work. So John will be um, in conversation with Gordon for a little while. Uh, and then we can interact with with them and ask questions um, around the work. Um, so um, I, I want to welcome um, Sally from um, Sally Mann, who worked with um, John as the co-producer of Fuse Production. Um, hello, Sally. Can you hear us? Your your microphone's not on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, great. And we can even see. Well, I can see you. Okay. Uh, okay. So thank you for coming, uh, Sally. Sally has also been helping us with the website um, to to kind of uh, and she 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 kindly uh, accepted to be um, to help me with inputting some of the material. Um, so that's that's. Uh, a, a great help. And then we also have um, hopefully with us Sheila Gilani. Um, Sheila, can you hear us? Yeah, just working out how to unmute there. Yeah, nice to see ah, you. Right, yeah. Nice, nice. Ah, here we go. Nice to see you. Um, and uh, Sheila is, uh, well, has been working with me in, in different uh, contexts and different ways. Um, and we've invited her as part of the Institute of um, Place as well to have a number of conversations over the summer uh, around place or rather displace um, uh, that we find ourselves uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, warm welcome to you, Sheila. Um, and I think everybody else, we know each other, <laughs> uh, but it's quite nice to have a uh, oh, hello, Kathy. Hello, Stevie. Good to see you appearing. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to pass it to John. Um, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the Institute of Place, and then um, I'll share my screen at some point to show you the website and where we are at now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so the Institute of Place um, has become or is becoming quite, uh, the concept of place is, I think, becoming a very important uh, theme within performance research. Um, especially perhaps even more so uh, you know, with COVID and, and after it for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But um, as uh, in, ter in terms of the way in which, you know, performances now take place in all sorts of extraordinary uh, range of places, I mean, there are there is a great growth of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity that's growing in terms of the way that work is made. Um, and with that, the new new types of partnerships that are evolving um, in relation to both within the universities and also outside and in terms of ex uh, external partnerships, um, having to devise new ways of working with audiences in in, 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 in extraordinary ways in strange places, etc., um, and using different spaces and places as as a resource within within work. So. From my experience, that's why we originally thought about the Institute of Place as being a really important area for performance research, because many things are happening in very different ways. And on a pragmatic level, um, the, the, the concept of place is, is, is increasingly important as a source of external funding, because the Arts Council, for example, as one 
a body of, uh, of, of, of funding has prioritized places, a way of working, bringing back community back into the into the themes of place so that CPP, Creative Places and People um, scheme, of which I'm working as part of one in uh, Somerset, is um, uh, it's again looking at the ways in which work is uh, and, and resources are funded, not necessarily by the art form so much or by the particular uh, by the particular venue, but is looking at putting funding into uh, into the concept of a, a geographical region or place. <clears throat> so the that that essence of that sort of has occurred very much out of my street arts, out of this street arts degree. That be that was becoming quite evident. Um, and there's lots of debate about how does how how does this yeah. work in practice? What what goes on when you when you change a whole set of different kinds of relationships, yeah. etc. So the, that, that's where the original idea came. But in terms of research, we're, we're very interested in, 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 the, in the nature of, um, uh, as I said, right now, for example, performance now has to perhaps focus on the hyper-local in the future. What's the relationship of a, of a group of people that may ha be fearful of working in, in close um, How does the external place uh, work? Uh, and with that, there's also questions of identity. Where are you from? And again, the race varies. Uh, now, the issues of, of, of race, of Brexit, lots of things are coming into this question. So um, we started off basically looking um, at the Institute of Place um, to, to generate and to interrogate and reformulate individual and collective relationships of the staff to place through knowledge exchange and through performance research related activities within the Faculty of Arts um, initially and perhaps within the university later and in relation to these external partnerships. Um, so from this, um, the uh, and there's also one other issue which we're, we're confronted with quite a lot in terms of practice and that's the sense of this experience economy this this strange strange idea of the uh, of a uh, sort of neoliberal kind of capitalism at this moment of the idea that people are are looking to ex uh, to buy into an experience to share it which which makes kind of performance kind of have to compete with a sports or a walk or a, all sorts of other issues but then there's also against that is the idea of well-being the idea that for example this is a, a this is a, an area again contested um, in terms of issues like placemaking, where certain um, governmental kind of policies are trying to drive change from above in terms of um, transforming uh, places of uh, traditional places of, of community versus another sort of source of conflict, which is people saying, no, we, w we wish to have a say in which place is made, etc. So it's a, it's a contested place without doubt. Um, and it's also um, it also coincides, as I said, with this, this growth of, of which has been going on in what we call the spatial turn for some time as people move away from the dedicated buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's really where where we started with. But we are really con interested in, in what does that mean really in terms of performance and performance research and how that might affect also in the future. The way that students have to think about what they 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 are doing. They might come in with a specific interest. They may go out finding themselves working in all sorts of of new environments, working with new vocabularies, with new partnerships, etc. So there is a there is a journey also into that territory as well as to what uh, might what it might mean pedagogically in relation to the performing arts student as a facilitator as well as being a performer as somebody who who works to. Um, build work in unusual places with unusual audiences that unusual in the sense of themselves. So we started off from that, from that broad territory um, and realizing that once you go out into the, the sense of the of, of new locations, you are in a way very difference between art and life. That a, a space be working in as a resource that you're having to deal as we do where we're running big festivals with a huge range of different agencies in order to to make something happen um so these boundaries are becoming very porous oh um 
so I, the, the, uh, Noel, do you want to add to that at all in terms of from the research point of view? I've sort of talked about it very broadly. Noel? Um, am I mute? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I think you, you did a very good overview of the um, you know origin of the project and um, where we are at. I think it's more where I'd like to um, build up from, um, which is um, what we had thought about at the beginning was to create a platform around um, notions and practices of places. Um, and, and like you said, John, that was something that came out of um, or emerged from noticing that in, in all, all the practices in DOPA um, research and knowledge exchange, um, uh, colleagues had something to do with place. Um, so we thought it would be a really great um, notion and practice to actually hook as well the faculty in um, terms of identity. Um, now, what we have is a platform to use. Um, so that's that's maybe today also a first conversation in terms of how we're going to be using it and how you know some feedback from from um, from you as well um, on how, how how do you think um, you might be using it or how you think um, your ideas on on, on developing um, project um, or how you might be using it for your own practice. Um, uh, how you might interact with it. So the website is is at the moment more an archive. Um, so we've um, we've we've had a kind of open call with people and asked people to send us some uh, material of projects that would have to do with um, with the notion and the practice of place. And we have a number of um, artists that are figured on the website. But it's certainly not the end of it. It's we we hope it's a it, it's a beginning. Um, so, um, and I know some people were not able to send us material because of time and because of the context that is quite challenging. Um, but it's a, it's a structure um, that allows us to have a, a research um, website a little bit more flexible from the CPPR, the Research Centre website, which is managed by Maya. And we'll have a link on our CPPR website, but the idea was to have something a little bit more um, flexible in terms of um, us managing the content of the website. So, should I show it to you? Yeah? Right. So, um, I'm going to share my screen and um, hopefully you can see that. John, can you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Is that so? So this is the the website, which is a WordPress um, on the WordPress uh, uh, platform, um, and this, we've got a beautiful image from Lucia uh, Lucia King, who is not able to be with us today uh, as a homepage, um, and then there's a number of projects um, that are figuring uh, on the homepage. Uh, so if we go to artist you most of you today are here so we have olu catherine marianne myself millie phil richard gordon lucia and john um so at the moment that's the material that we managed to gather um and uh I don't know, should I go to each page? <laughs> what do you think, John? We didn't think that much. Could you say that again? What should I do? Go to each page or should I? We didn't think that much in terms of presenting. No, we'll send you. Just illustrate uh, one of the artists' page will be good, I think. Right. Right. I'll, uh, I think Phil has a bit uh, of material. So we click on Phil and then we have Phil image Phil's image um, and his um, bio and then you can click on different projects um, so if we click on his latest project uh, an invitation then you go to the project page which tell us more about what the invitation is about um, and has a few more images again this will depend on how much material you have 
then there's a website and then if we click back on the artist you go back to the um artist page for Phil. Um, so it's very similar um, idea for the project page um, so people can navigate through either project or with the name of the project or through artist so um, if we take um, well Gordon's project that we're going to hear about um, and Gordon had some podcasts so we've got the, type, the kind of summary of the project and then um, a number of podcasts that you can listen or yeah sound sound um, and then you can navigate from one project to the other from the side um, so we have John and Sally's and Richard's project um, and then you can go to the artist page um, here and local show for local people um, and then we have the about page which uh, offer a little bit more information about the Institute of Place um, and which was a bit summarized by um, John in his um, and this is this is this is the website for now So we've started off as an invitation um, for a collaborations in relation to the idea of a place that might relate or your work might relate to. Um, we've we've started, as I said, in a very uh, looking at archive and current work, and then from that basis, looking to see what the basis of that might be in terms of publicizing and developing that work to an external audience, as well as looking for the basis of how that work might develop around themes um, that you're working with in relation to external funding in the future, if that's the way that you wanted to work with us and with each other. Um, so that if, for example, I mean, I'm looking at um, looking at the, the the idea of place you know in in some ways it's all embracing i mean every aspect of people's work has to do to some extent with with the idea of place but the way that it's framed um is, is really important which might bring us to my my uh, discussion with gordon what do you think yes yes i mean i think we can um uh, maybe before we go into that um it would be great to hear it, if there's any kind of feedback or before we move on in terms of if you want to see anything on the website or any feedback that you know from what you've seen. So if you and I don't know if everybody unmute themselves um because it that's we can't see everybody like on Zoom, so I, it's um but is there can yeah, can can people see the website i don't even know that yeah we've seen seen it but i've seen it anybody else got any comment people well i i think it's great to see all the artists work and the collections of the projects um so that's really helpful it'd be interesting to know how how well you know how it will develop um and it can grow. It, it's now a platform which is at the beginning and has the potential um, to really imagine and, and bring other artists possibly, um, depending on commissions, to talk about place. Yes, so we, we're planning to the, the next phase. First of all, you know, um, other people are very uh, welcome to send us more material. I know Tom, um, that uh, some of your work might be really relevant um, for this project. Um, perhaps, you know, Annabelle as well. I don't, you know, I don't know. This is this is just really coming the invitation, and we're really grateful for the people that have been sending some material. Um, but you, you know, so you can see how, how it can evolve in terms of, of archiving and and promoting your work and kind of showcasing the work that is has been done and is being done as well. Because there's, there's a possibility of adding more projects. So, for instance, Phil had two projects, but you know we could we could add actually more 
you know, more projects. So that there's, you know, there's an ambition to be an archive as well, um, but also to have a sense of promoting the work that is being currently done. Um, like in Olu's case, you know, Olu gave us a project that he's working on at the moment. Um, so that's one thing. And then the, the next phase for us is for the Institute of Place is to confirm partnership. Um, so we've discussed, um, uh, we've had a meeting with Andrew Loretto from um, Hardfair. Uh, John had um, also discussion with Simon from 101 Center. Um, there's uh, a number of people that we've been thinking about, but because of the context we've been in the last few months, this has slowed a little bit. So we're thinking to, to do our kind of confirming partnership in our second phase, um, which will start in September. Um, and, um, and that, you know, we, we hope that some of you can help us steering this new phase of confirming this partnership in view of common project, collaborative project, in view of applying for funding, um, so to have, you know, to, to, to have stuff happening um, within and outside of the university. So that is kind of the ambition. Uh, Anything so else? John and Noel, uh, just to say, it looks like people are answering your questions and commenting in chat, but I suspect that you two aren't seeing it. That's why you thought that nobody was responding when you were asking questions. My, I, I don't know whether you've got chat turned on, but people are seeing things in chat, but not out loud. Hey, thank you for that, Gordon. Yes, I've opened that up now. <laughs> Super. Thank you. No, I don't always see that. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, can you, um, Millie, you have a question there. Yes, could you tell us how to upload? Yeah. Do you want to pass, um, Noel, do you want to answer yeah. that question? Yeah, well, for, for the moment, I'm I'm actually managing the upload. So our graphic designer finished her work of, you know, building the website um, and the, the functionality and some of the basic material at first um, and um, because we don't have a research assistant at the moment to um, help us with the archiving of work we um, I've, I've taken that on so at the moment if you want to you just send stuff to me basically and I will um, upload things and um, create you know a profile or create an extra project mm. Yeah. We, the other thing that we haven't, we've got another page that is uh, news, but obviously because it's new, we don't have any news yet, so we haven't actually put that page live. But again, once the, the website is taking off and people are using it, um, we, we might have, we might add the, we might um, activate the page, the news page. Um, and I think I will be using this as well a lot for CPPR, you know, for the events that are happening through CPPR, as well as using the university one. Noel, a quick, uh, sorry, just a little technical glitch. I, I really love it, and it's it's really nice to see everyone's work on it. Just a small technical glitch on the main page, when you go into the read more link in exploring individual and collective relationships. Um, yeah. The main one, uh, the read more link is broken. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. And then at the moment, I think, um, Tom, you also mentioned, um, where's the read more? Ah, yeah. So yeah. It just has to go, like, there has to be a slash WordPress before the about, I think. It's a technical. Uh, you know, no, I know. Yeah, exactly. I know why it's happening. It's because um, the it's not live yet. So yes. at the moment, the, our graphic designer, did a, Sarah, didn't actually um, publish it. Yeah, for we wanted to, so it's still private, um, and that's why you have to add WordPress. Um, but once it's launched with us, with you guys, and they, you know, everybody, because I think it was also the opportunity for people who sent us the material to see what we've done with it. Um, so from 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 today, we'll, we'll actually release it in the big world wild and wide world of the internet. So you wouldn't have to put um, WordPress anymore. You will go to the institute of place.org and then that will go directly to the website. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I really like the outline, the layout though. And, and I think the, the like, 
just the strong image or the strong image base is really nice as a, as a way to get introduced to people's projects. It's interesting how this will work with like sound and you know things that are less visually strong, but I, I think it will be as 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 actually Gordon's is a, is a good yeah. But I actually, think. I think Gordon's project is really interesting because I think it's um, he managed to do both, you know, to do quite strong images and exactly. then the sound is, you know, the primer um, medium of his work. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about that uh, later, but I think it's a very good example of what you can do uh, and incorporate sound uh, in a visually attractive way. Uh, so Tom, please send stuff, you know, I know you're doing your, the stuff in Winchester, the, the exhibition. Um, the, I know there's a number of projects that I would love to, to be able to, um, to include on the website. So yeah, maybe, maybe um, if you have time to start sending me stuff, I can sure. uh, create a profile. Right? It looks really nice. It's a nice way to have everyone's work together as well. Yeah. Right. I, I, Olu, is that okay? The way that I've uh, sorry, and just a personal thing, because uh, Olu is that because I know Olu is going to have to he's going to have to leave very soon. Um, so is that all right? The way that I've um, included your 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 work. Yeah, your, yes, your, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm okay for a bit. There, the the um, the uh, hospital transport hasn't come yet, so. I'm okay. So it's very interesting listening to everybody. Okay. Are you at the hospital at the moment? Yes, I've just finished the. Uh, I've just finished di dialysis. That's why I had it. That's why I had the um, my uh, uh, camera turned off because I was busy I disconnecting myself from the machine. But okay. uh, yeah. Okay. Um, my, yeah, no, I, I've yeah. had a look at the, br briefly looked at the um, the website, and I think it's a really good thing, um, really um, excellent way of seeing other people's work. I loved Gordon's um, uh, presentation, <clears throat> and the, and also the the sense of its wider reach. I think one of the things that would be interesting to consider, and I think you've already intimated this already, uh, about dissemination and ways in which um, we uh, utilise uh, the increasing new platforms with which to disseminate material. Um, for, for, for reasons of um, exposure and also um, for recruitment, but um, but that's, I think that's prob probably for later. Um, but uh, I have I think like all of us, my, that's what I'm doing at the moment. But I I'm busy working on a little archive of my work. So once I get that into perspective, I can then send that on to you in some way. Where I've taken the lead from what Gordon's done. I think the use of images and video as a way for people to sort of like access ideas is a good is a good way. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, thank you, Olu. I mean, there is, a, there is also the, uh, I think Kathy's page is quite interesting as well. Uh, I'll show you a little bit. Um, I don't know where we are. Oh, yes, I think there. So Kathy, because uh, she also had video, um, and the interesting thing as well is that her project was something that she had reflected in an article. So we used the article. Um, so the project, I, I actually, uh, with, with Cathy, call a feeling of place time. Um, but it's actually a number of, of um, projects that she's been working on across eight years, I think. Um, so if you, when you click on the project, um, it's, there's actually the, some text images and then there's links to also videos for each of the projects that you can see from 2011, 2016 and 2010. So that's, that's a lovely archive that really fits, um, you know, with that theme of space as well. And she had also reflected on it um, in, a, in a published article. So, you know, you get, it's quite, it's lovely because you get some academic um, reflection, you get the artistic work. Um, so in terms of dissemination and the use of the website, I find it um, Can I ask one great. question about um, capacity for the website? Yeah. How much, how much are we allowed when it comes to the capacity for yeah, just thinking about capacity. What's I mean, because you've got it's, it's on WordPress. You're doing it, is that right? Yes, yes. 
Yeah. What's the capacity? What's the um, um, memory capacity? Or the... So apparently we've got quite a lot. Yes. Yeah, so there's no, not really a restriction. We we um, we uh, um. Shane Millie's uh, website, as I think it's quite interesting as well. It was it, I, I drew it from from um, her blog, so yeah. using some of the, pro the, uh, the project and the later. And what it allows us to do as well is to um, uh, showcase collaborators. You know, so you you've got link to other people's work, um, which of course is very good for us to do as well. Um, so it's yeah, so it's kind of expanding. Um, so. So yeah, to come back to your, um, I'm going to stop. Uh, there is no limit because we bought a domain. Of, um, so we we actually have um, John and I um, are paying <laughs> at the moment uh, for this, this website to exist. So it's got quite a lot of um, uh, capacity in terms of uh, memory and in terms of uh, yeah uh, um, place. So I, I don't I, know how much technical of it, but quite a lot here. Yeah. yeah. Could I interrupt you? I just it's, it's just gone half past, and I was just wondering if uh, talking to Gordon, how long we yeah went. yeah is this a good moment yeah 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 absolutely. I don't know, everybody yeah. if I could just move on to having a chat to Gordon about his work, which you know found it yeah thank you so um yeah um whoever recommended this thank you very much because it was wonderful I I came across the BBC of it um, uh, one Saturday night and was completely impressed with what I heard um, um, and the Institute of Place for example I, I was thinking about that in relation to Gordon's work it's a uh, you know it's wonderful how it challenges traditional storytelling it draws from different places the use of the authenticity of verbatim theater I mean so many so many wonderful elements to to, to that um, in previous in recent talks to Gordon he's told me well actually that's part of it the end what you heard was the end of it uh, uh, end of one particular part of a journey when it got to the BBC but the the part of his work which were the sound files etc um, uh, and the and, and the different elements of it um, was 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 another aspect of it. So that took me to another set of 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 uh, looking at the work, and um, so it's been a, it's been a fantastic journey so far. Just uh, exactly as I would want an institute of place to work, it would take me into an artist's work that took me onto different blogs, into different places, into the outcomes in the BBC, into outcomes, into research, into articles about nuclear Oceania. Oceania. A wonderful, wonderful kind of journey about researching into into somebody else's work and finding the connections wherever they might be between my work and his work etc although you know that's that's for me to sit down and contemplate so um um uh so i i just i, I don't want to talk too much about what i what i discovered i want to ask gordon about his work just to explain first of all that that thing that the difference between what people received if they followed the link was the BBC mediated um, uh, version and Gordon's essential work. Uh, they are two different elements of it. Um, um, but what I was going to ask Gordon, if he would like to describe a given account of what the work was about, first of all, for anybody that is, doesn't know about it. Gordon, could you just give us a, a framing of your work so to, of this particular nuclear children project? Um, yeah, uh, well, to start at the beginning, I'd sort of worked for a long time with this particular community of nuclear vets, uh, nuclear veterans of people who'd watched these nuclear bombs go off uh, in the 50s. Um, and in earlier iterations, had worked with them on projects that ended up being a piece of verbatim theatre. Uh, and more recently, there was a chance to sort of revive a project and it was under the umbrella of something called Nuclear Futures, which was largely based in Australia of people responding, different artists responding to the tests. And I got asked if I would be interested in doing another verbatim piece. Uh, and I, I wasn't really very interested. I, I, um, I hadn't ever been particularly happy with the results of the work that we'd sort of done before for different reasons. But I did want to follow this idea of trying to make these um, 
audio pieces which mixed uh, testimony with something else and and really told the story through narrative poetry and I'd, I'd always sort of there was sort of a couple of things that a couple of people I've sort of hero worshipped or their work I've hero worshipped for a long time and uh, probably one is Tony Harrison, who was a pioneer of making film poems uh, in the 60s, along with people like Alan Plater, uh, a famous one called The Shadow of Hiroshima, but uh, a number of others where you would see images and poetry. And more recently, Simon Armitage was doing that sort of thing where he was mixing interviews with people uh, and their testimony, mixing that uh, to make films. Um, and then the work of John Berger, who quite often will mix photography, you know, uh, his work on Sassel, the country doctor, or on the um, Turkish immigrants, where he mixed photography and poetry with testimony and experience. And so all of those things coming together made me think, okay, well, this is what I quite like to do. And also because the big problem with theatre is you eventually you have to have a lot of people in the same room. And if it's a rainy night in Leeds on a particular thing and you need, you know, you can, particularly with community theatre you spend a lot of work and hoping that an audience will come uh, so all of those reasons sort of coming together really and then the other thing was I sort of part of the problem with telling the story of the veterans is um, the sort of story starts with a big explosive climactic nuclear bomb going off which is really where a story ought to finish you know, and so you tell their story and they all want to tell the story of going out and leaving their families and going out to the thing. And actually, and then the nuclear bomb goes off. But it's the actual story. Their story really is a very slow, tedious pedestrian decline uh, that comes after the climax. And so it's hard to tell. And so I got interested in the story of their descendants who carry around with them continuously the the nuclear story the effects of their if you depending on which science you believe that actually you know if there, there is a possibility that something chromosomal has been passed on to them and they carry that around with them so i was sort of quite interested in hearing their stories and then trying to use this sort of obsession i had with other writers and other practitioners and artists to to find this new way of telling their stories and the two things sort of fused a bit like that Right. Did you? I. It's it's really interesting. Um, for for me, the the audio the audio nature of it was extraordinarily visual. Um, and the, my first, I said, my first bearing, as I said, was through the BBC. And then I I heard that you you know I could I could hear the the beautiful soundscape, which I think has something to do with Steve Soloway and with Amanda Smallbone and Tim. Pretty, I think. It other artists came in on this in particular ways. Could you tell us something about that journey working across? Yeah, yeah well, this, uh, after the the first person, I sort of collaborated with lots of different people. The point about these things is I'm not very good at anything. There's not much I can, you know, I, I, I sort of have one idea, but I, I don't know how to use software and I'm not a musician and I'm not a thing. So, uh, uh, I'm not much of a, I'm not much use really, but I, 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 other than having an initial idea. Uh, and so there's a little, collaborated with lots of people. The first person, Paul Carter from the um, uh, film department. Um, uh, and so I had this idea, it was always going to start with very simple narrative poetry because that's sort of where that was going to tie up these um, stories, the bits of testimony in the interviews uh, that was the original idea and so I was always going to need a sound designer come editor come things and then something that as I began to so in the very first one with Steve Clifford I also went off to interview a radiation biologist and so by accident just sort of by discovery the the piece became a bit of a a conversation or an argument between those two or a conversation between those two. Steve Clifford, who was a nuclear descendant, was also a Reiki healer and carried around this idea that um, he was an absorber of energies because, you know, I I don't really have much truck with Reiki healing. I, it's not, you know, I think they're all, it's all nonsense. But nevertheless, he believed himself to be an absorber of energies in the same way that his father had absorbed certain energies. And then there was a, a radiation biologist who was able to talk about what does happen to the body when 
um, energies get absorbed. And so I sort of able to put those two things together and then we created this, um, and on that work, when we brought in a different a composer to actually create the music. So the, the mixture of the sound design and the composition and then these voices come in and then with this narrative poetry and then that particular one, again, um, we chose the as Steve, the interviewer, was talking to me. Uh, one of the things that I kept looking at was this picture that he um, uh, was hanging in his room. Uh, he's a digital artist as well, but he made. And we talked a little bit about that picture. And so, for some reason, the picture became the narrator of that poem. I think there's a line in it. Um, I'm the picture that stares down at Steve. Um, and she she becomes the narrator and she talks about how she's been changed and manipulated. So it's essentially it's sort of set the form, a, a composer, a sound designer, uh, the interviewee, and then an expert of some sort. You know, the, the, so they were the sort of components. So then when we went on to make the next one, which was uh, Shelley Grigg, whose dad had gone off to be a, a Franciscan friar. He'd watched a number of bombs go off and then um, become an alcoholic and gone off to be a Franciscan friar. So on that one, we mixed, again, the same notion of composition, the sound designer, narrative poetry, the, the descendant speaking, and then some sort of expert. So in that one, the expert was a Franciscan friar. I, you know, and I went and I spoke to this guy about transubstantiation and St. Francis and various other things. And so again, her, her discussion about her own condition begins to wrap up to a discussion about transubstantiation. And then the other thing that began, I began to realize that they were all about change, which wasn't actually happening, a bit like transubstantiation. It sort of happens if you believe it or it doesn't happen, but maybe something happens in the community that believe in it. And so this notion of imperceptible change began to appear through the, through the pieces. And they had, they sort of began, and again, by accident, really, I think, um, slightly dystopian resonance to them, um, that somebody commented on. And I think that that's where, and I think the reason that the community that of descendants began to like them was because pinpoint to clear and I wasn't calling it that. Lost contact there for a moment. Uh, sorry, John. Just uh, I think one of the reasons that they were picked up so well by the descendant community and the nuclear community is they seem to capture this thing that I later came to call the nuclear uncanny. I never called it that at the time because I'd never heard the phrase, but this sort of feeling that they all were carrying around with them, that something wasn't quite right, that there was changes going on in their body which were imperceptible. And I think somehow these pieces seem to, for them, articulate a feeling they had that nobody else had been able to articulate before. Mm -hmm. And that's why they were sort of quite accepted. And so by the time I made the third one, I was quite conscious of the idea of the uncanny. And so it became quite central. It actually mentions the uncanny in that third one, because by that time um, it was sort of thing. But that same formula existed, a sound designer, a composer, some narrative poetry, a descendant and an expert. And in the third one, the expert was Tim Prentke talking about theatre because we invented this fictional theatre is this place where things change, but actually they don't really change. And so in that third one, we invented Sharon Harris was this woman I interviewed and she was sitting in a wheelchair talking about how she used to be a dancer and would be a dancer again, even though her legs were all smashed to pieces. Mm. Uh, and so in that one, we put in that fictional sound world we put her on a stage in a theatre and in the next stage her dad is on a theatre watching the lights come up and go back down and come, come back down and in the next theatre we're exactly halfway through a Samuel Beckett play called Endgame where somebody's in a wheelchair and they're in decay and in the audience is Tim Prenke, a theatre academic, and he's explaining us, to us how theatre works and how Beckett works and what change means in theatre. So that's sort of one of the themes that began to run through the... Well, it, what, what was really extraordinary is the, is the different places that you managed to um, place against each other within, within the telling of the story, um, which is 
you know, which and you started off with a kind of a traditional Aristotle kind of definition of a narrative arc and then said this is the story at all that follows those journeys. And the idea that that um, um, uh, that you can move between you can move between different places and that the story itself would disappear and reappear in another place. I thought that's a really intriguing idea. Yeah. Around that overriding atmosphere of sublime terror and and specifically i like the idea of the relationship between story and portraiture yeah there's something that moves through time and then something that is held in time do, 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 do you want to talk about that at all because i thought that was really intriguing this you know and the story is not yet told <laughs> we haven't got to the denouement even <laughs> yeah i mean i suppose i mean you know, if you go back to Aristotle, there's a vague sense that things should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. That that's how a story works. And in the the most striking of them, the end is something. You know, our hero um, has a series of problems. He finds out, or she finds out, that the world isn't quite like it is. There's things that have to be untied. There's revelations. There's a climactic ending, and then our hero returns home slightly sadder and wiser and that's how a story works in the thing but in the veterans story the climax comes at the start and the and the rest of it is a bit pedestrian and dull and it takes years for them to you know uh to reach the end of the story she's just a slow cancerous step uh and in the descendants there is there isn't a beginning a middle and an end it's just as a, a thing they inhabit and carry around with them uh all of the time so in terms of, I suppose the you know the change change through time is the driving the driving engine of narrative of storytelling, and in portraiture, it's the very opposite. It's it's the frozen moment. There is no beginning or no end. And I I think I saw in a descendant something in between the two. There was a, a story where the change was was imperceptible. There was change, but the change couldn't be, couldn't ever be seen or known. So it didn't work as a story. It didn't quite work as a portrait. So, uh, you know, I, I call them portraits of nuclear children, but they're, they're story portraits, if you like, that they're, you know, they're, they're, they don't exist. T time doesn't, isn't the engine that drives them. And then I suppose the other thing I think that you alluded to in the question is what you began to express itself in the pieces was the way that in this strange uncanny nuclear world you know the, there's certain things if we go back to Freud and his definition of, of the uncanny it, it doesn't obey temporal laws you know the concepts such as deja vu where something has happened even though it's never happened or it's it's happened again but it never happened before and things like doppelganger where the same person appears in different places they're the they're the very basics according to freud of of the uncanny and so they were they were happening in people's um uh experience all of the time their relationship with time and geography was different because they had this sense of nuclear and canny embodied in them. So, it, so as an example, in the, one of the pieces, Steve Clifford, he told me a story about when he was a little kid and he had the he used to hang these aeroplanes up in his room and put, sit sit under his duvet and pretend that he was flying them. And then he had this strange, terrifying premonition where he thought he heard a voice. The windows rattled and everything. He had, thought he heard a voice come to him and say you are black body you are black bodies and that was his story and he told me it and um later on we find out that black body is a term used by max planck to describe something which absorbs energy but but in that moment of him sitting terrified under his duvet so clutching onto his knees sitting upright there's able to sort of link him to a similar moment of his father sitting 50 years before uh, uh, on Christmas Island in front of a nuclear explosion in that same brace position and sort of to bring that moment together. And, and, and so that moment of the plane, the plane that's dry, flying past carrying the valiant that's flying past carrying the bomb and the plane that Steve Clifford 
thinks he can hear that he's flying. And at the same time in the interview, there actually really was a real plane going past. And he refers to it as a plane going past. Now, all of those moments sort of come together in this way that's not really chronolo you know, chronological. And I, I'm, I can't remember enough about the poem. Um, uh, to something, though part in time, in their brace position seem to rhyme. And it sort of sets the two up, Steve in his bed and his dad, the thing, both absorbing these terrible energies, these apocalyptic energies, but n not one then and one 50 years later, but both right now in this uncanny temporal, non geographical space and time. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. The other thing that a beautiful metaphor you used in your writing about the work in your blog uh, was the role of the digital that carries the story like a message in a bottle across the world arrives um, in terms of, uh, for me, in the terms of where I, I heard it's an audio medium in, in the end. But do you want to say anything more about the role of the digital, you think, in relation to this work? Um. Yeah, well, sort of going back to sort of the work I'd done before in verbatim, the theatre, and this notion of if you're doing something that's vaguely community drama related, or in my case, I was working with a campaigning organisation who at the time were campaigning for justice. They wanted compensation for what they had done. And so the bog standard thing of verbatim theatre is you get different people's stories, you get actors to tell them uh, and we put it on a thing called a stage and then what you hope is people will come and see it now people will come and see it because they like to hear their story told back to them in a theatrical form and they're strengthened but as a campaign thing what you want is people who have the agency to make change to come and see it you want councillors and politicians and you know those people who can actually push the campaign forward to come and see it and it's it's sort of a problem that, you know, if you're if you're making theatre for a campaign, thing, because all it takes is a traffic jam and the, the, the important person doesn't turn up, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and also, I, uh, much as I sort of like making things, I don't really like managing things or administrating things. Um, and I'm not very good at it. And so I was looking for a bit more of a monastic solo project that I could do. So that's where part of that came from. But also it came with the notion of, making these things and then letting them go in the hope that they would just be picked up. So very early on, you know, the way they worked is that they were just sort of really passed around the descendants and their Facebook page. One of the organisations that emerged as I was working was this thing called the Nuclear Communities Charities Fund. And they began to work, are still working on this thing of virtual museums where you go to memorials and you put your back put your phone against the barcode and then you hear you enter a virtual museum that you can hear on your phone so their idea for doing that sort of came along um so i don't want to take credit for doing that but it, their idea came from that as a sort of re, result of to some extent of the digital work the idea that people could walk past a real memorial scan a code and hear one of my pieces um you know, and then get some background information about the nuclear tests and the veterans and the being TVA and that sort of stuff. So that, so originally that's sort of what it was. It was the descendants passing it amongst themselves uh, and emailing each other. And it went, the term I suppose is it went viral, but I didn't really go viral, but lots of people began to pass it to relatives around the world. And there's obviously an American um, uh, nuclear veterans community and there's an Australian and there's a New Zealand nuclear so they sort of began to arrive there and were listened to so not as a collective audience but lots of individuals you know and in a campaigning sense it was to try to get away from this notion of always trying to need to get the attention of journalists contradictorily what actually happened was it did this message in a bottle did end up at the feet of a BBC producer, and I'm never quite sure how, but a BBC producer came across it, and that's why she got in touch wanting to do something about it for the BBC. Absolutely. Can I hold you there a second, Gordon? Uh, that's a really good indication of how how possibly an institute of place could work in terms of a website and how it gets into other places, arriving with new new, audi new audiences and new and new areas that you wouldn't normally expect. Could I take a pause there, and before we finish, could I ask anybody? 
if they have any questions they want to ask about the work, because it would be really lovely to hear from you in relation to either of what you've heard or what you've read beforehand. Open you all up. Uh, okay, I, I have one. Yeah. Um, which is kind of a, a one about the future. So what what's next in terms of um, using, it's almost like a, an amazing model of, of um, of narrative and, and theater making. Um, and I know you've got projects in, um, that were interrupted, Gordon, because of um, our pandemic context. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the future and development of, of how you're thinking about developing this idea, but maybe at a, at, with another subject? Um, yeah, am I still unmuted? Um, yes. I. I a thing that I was interested in doing, and um, but obviously in this new world it's uh, been dropped, is um, I was just quite interested in taking these and given that they had, the original idea had come out of theatre, of actually taking them and um, trying to turn them back into theatre and uh, was sort of into... I had a notion of doing a little bit of workshop with some of the, the sound designers or composers that we'd would use and then bring in actors in to play the parts of the testaments. And so I had something lined up to do a series of workshops with a possibility of creating the show at the um, uh, RADA, the RADA festival. And uh, <laughs> do you know, in this strange time, I can't remember whether I've meant that to happen this summer or next summer. It's, I just completely can't remember. Anyway, either way, it's not, uh, it, yeah, it's unlikely to happen. And I think I, there, there'd been an application for funding. I think that I'd got the funding, but then it had been taken away because there was no thing to do. Um, but going forward, I, I, I think for various reasons, I need to move away from the nuclear uh, community stuff um, for reasons that I won't really go into. But um, the other thing that was happening just before the world changed is I got invited to put a pitch in for the UNHCR. They were going to do a big series of projects for their 70th anniversary. And I was quite interested in doing a similar project, but on statelessness. They're doing a big campaign about the concept of statelessness. And I was interested in something where I might go and interview different people about statelessness, either refugees or lawyers or politicians or philosophers or physicists about what state is and statelessness is and see if you could knock together, you know, something sort of similar. Um, so I uh, put in a bit for that. But again, again uh, all of that notion that you know everything is just closed down now uh, because of the thing. But if there's something that's going to be picked up in the new world, it will probably be that. I mean, interestingly enough, I don't, on the face of, of it, this is the sort of stuff that can be done in this type of environment where you don't actually have to meet people. But my feeling is it just doesn't work unless you're actually sitting on the sofa for a long time talking to somebody. Um, you, you don't really get the stories that you want to get. It's unlikely that anybody will really unfold, uh, you know, over a Zoom meeting or a team meeting. So I think it, it can't happen until travel is back to uh, to normal. But and in terms of what's happening at the UNHCR, I, I have just no idea. Um, but anyway, that was that's where I would would take it or will take it, depending on how the world shifts. Mm. I, I just to respond to that, Gordon. I I've been on obviously as a practitioner now. I've been on lots and lots of different um, zooms and conversations in different places, and there are a whole set of new relationships building that normally, if you followed down your traditional route, um, it would continue, but it stopped. And new priorities are coming up in a in a hugely enormous way. Um, 
uh, I, I, I talked earlier on about arts and well-being, etc. And I, and it was very interesting when I was listening to your piece on on that uh, Saturday night. Um, it absolutely resonated around the uncanny, what was going on around us at this particular time. So even if it was not directly related, it it kind of connected very strongly and powerfully and felt very, very relevant, even though about another subject, the idea of the invisible and the uncanny and the, uh, you know, and what's going on at this particular moment. So the, the strange things happen you know, when you... Uh, when you hear things in in one context and you're in another context, yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. I cause I'm reading a lot of stuff about uh, you know online theatre and what's happening in the theatre. But um, I mean, what uh, it is, I'm interested in what will happen to the nature to our idea about contagion. You know, the Gre the Greeks were terrified of things being contagious, and theatre was a big part of. Uh, absolving or um, ridding themselves of various contagions that were floating around them. The, the, the worry of being, uh, of catching something from what you saw or what you experienced or what you met or even what you did. By all of, um, uh, was very central to the Greeks. And I, I, this part of me wonders, you know, whether the theatre will come back with this renewed notion that uh, everybody else is riddled with contagious things that you need to separate yourself from. Mm. But the audio nature of your work will make it absolutely easy to move on through to audiences, where theatre work will be much more difficult, perhaps, in the future, if that makes sense. No, yeah, yes, yes. I, like, once, once, the, once it's there, the distribution is, yeah, is... And in a way, it's sort of there's a, a bigger question about whether it's still theatre. It's theatrical in its kernel, in its heart, I suppose. But you know, once these things just become audio podcast documentary poems or whatever, you know, it's it's sort of a question of you know whether we redefine our terms. You know, and we keep saying, oh, we can do theatre like this, and we we can certainly do this. It's whether it's still we define it as theatre or not. Yeah, but the audio, for example, the audio in outdoor space is going to be really interesting in the future. Mm -hmm. You can imagine audiences being able to split up and go off in different directions around a site and and be engaged through storytelling or through whatever else is here audio wise. These are the projects which are going to be probably first back into the arena of performing arts. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt that whatever comes next, rules that sort of push where people. We've we've broken up a bit there. Gordon, can you say something? Can you say that again? tend to call immersive theatre where you know you think of a punch drunk model where people go and have an individual experience you know you might walk around a labyrinth or a maze or through a building but you yourself have a series of in, in of individual experiences um and it, it's not something i care for much I, I like a collective communal experience i think it's, it says more about our capitalist system where you secretly hope you've got a better experience than everybody else when you come together in the bar you sort of you're you're trading yours against everybody else's and hoping that you come out best but so i like it when everybody experiences the same thing at the same time but certainly that's that's lost to us for the next few years that possibility or maybe people regather in other ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, you know, the idea of the outdoor space and the collectives, because yes, it's individual, but we are part of huge collectives, masses of audiences all focusing together on one point, whether that's, you know, um, looking at spectacle, um, traveling around sites through trails through audio through visual and i think it would be really interesting to consider that your, your work and the multiplicity of that and the scale 
the potential of the scale is 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 quite huge you know and i i come from that from directing festivals from directing large scale pieces to very small intimate sound recordings so and visuality um so i think the potential possibly is could be really quite huge depending on which direction you want to head in really mm. um you know i mean we I'm, I mean, personally, I'm always looking for really, really interesting work, and we, um, you know, we, 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 we've come in, in, in Somerset with the festival that we run. It's like a, a red dot in a blue county in Bridgewater is a Labour, you know, town council who are quite, you know, active in a blue conservative. So it's a really interesting dynamic mix of what we create there. And also working with very different cultural communities there as well, who have stories to tell. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting, yeah. Just want to throw that over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also interesting in terms of um, uh, uh, how time works and availability. Like, I'm, I'm just going to notice that um, we are 15 or we've been 15 participants um, today uh, in this conversation and I, I don't think I've you know all the things that I've organized before for CPPR we've never been that many <laughs> um, and, and I do think that it's because you know it's online as well and um, because we're super busy it's not necessarily because you know we have more availability in terms of time but it's because because we can give that hour um, of, of focusing on the same thing together um, and so that's that you know that's something to to bear in mind I think for theatre and for everything that we do um, yeah and I mean if I could just add to other particular things so Millie for example one of these suggestions about for example you know there's there are these extraordinary opportunities now from for 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 the voice outdoors you know, in different locations, using different spaces, etc. Um, people talk, people talk rather glibly about opera on balconies, etc. I don't quite mean that, but again, you know, where does where does the voice where where is the voice happening in different places? I don't know if you've uh, got any thoughts on that. Over to you, Millie. Yes, yes, my um, uh, my choir met last night in a friend's garden. Yeah, and uh, we put she has a little orangery, so we put the keyboard, my keyboard, up just in the orangery and we all sang standing around just a small group of us in the garden and then the larger choir will be meeting on wednesday in the playing fields yeah, yeah. in little groups so the sopranos will be one group because we're allowed to meet up to six because my choir is quite elderly so we are developing gatherings yeah. in sort of quite interesting ways because of the needs of you know Mine's a village choir, a community choir. It's not anything professional. Everybody can join. It's it's a very sort of inclusive environment, and so it was important to keep everybody involved. And so we've we've had to try and get back together physically as soon as possible because people were finding the Zoom very hard work. So um, yeah, we're already starting to meet again in safe ways and distanced ways. Yeah. Um, because it was really important to be able to sing together. Yeah. And that's the thing that links to what you were saying. It's the singing together, because yeah. on Zoom you can only sing and hear yourself. Yeah. And as a pragmatist, Billy, um, you know, the Let's Create 10 year scheme is all about what that is, what you've just described. And the role of the artist as yourself is that facilitator that makes it all happen. It can bring it together mm -hmm. and and the funding will be very much aiming towards those areas yeah it's massively important um that the artist has to listen and has to facilitate not to drive the idea in the first place so those are those are kind of key key interests of mine at the moment uh richard I was thinking about misguided tours and, and audio and whether in fact it ever takes place, whether it can just be a, a you know, take another form or do you think it yeah, well, has to be a visual? Not necessarily, John. I mean, it's, uh, am I echoing? Uh, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And we talked about the caravan show and how that could be done without actually being anywhere. If you, well, being 
in the caravan in the space and the way that we can use we we can use the um, technology to do that as it were the gathering it's very interesting isn't it yeah i i, I was wondering um sheila are you still with us um i i i'm, I'm I am aware that we are a little bit over time, but um, I can't see her. I just wanted to ask something to Sheila, but um, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, but I just wanted to ask you on, on that question of um, intimacy <laughs> and, and you know, the kind of pretty men that we're finding ourselves. Um, and because and, Gordon talked about, you know, that kind of, lack of intimacy with, with the medium um, that we're communicating through now. Um, with your work, I just wanted to know, which is very much centered on gathering people and togetherness and, and, and um, building a sense of intimacy between people. I was just wondering if, you, if there was anything that resonated in what's been said. Mm. Um, it's interesting, I think I'm still really working stuff out um i was trying to think about what i've been doing over this period of time and i think i've been doing a lot of photography so maybe that's i don't know and also audio work as well yeah i'm not really sure i don't think i've worked it out i've got a couple of projects on hold one with young carers um and in a way that project doesn't feel like it can necessarily happen unless we're together um so I don't know, I'm just taking it very slowly and reflecting still on a lot of it. feel very much in the middle still. It's yeah. going to take ages to work out the, the route through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, thinking, rethinking practice is... Um, Absolutely. Is and I think in a way, what's great is that my practice really shapeshifts anyway, and I'm used to working in lots of different mediums. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to the live. We, we've got Common Salt, which is just for 25 people, booked again in November at the Museum of London. And me and Sue are just not sure whether it's actually going to happen or not. So that's going to be interesting to find out whether they'll let 25 people gather together in a room, whether we'll be able to do that or not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, everything is uncertain. Great. I'm aware of time, John. Yes. Uh, one. Are we finished? <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I just want to answer, reply to Sheila. Really, for one thing, there's an awful lot. There's there seems to be a division of people that are going. For example, um, uh, yes, it's a great opportunity for new things to happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as as if. You know, it was that easy, but that sometimes that change can take an awful long time, and and it's good that it takes a long time to reshape. Mm. You know? um, because you know um, that the, you know you one comes from such a uh, you know having come through such a, a particular journey to get to to get to where your present work is that it's. That you know, it's it's never going to be that easy, and, and space is what you need, and time to 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 redefine lots of the base ground of your future. So I just I'm just you know I'm sharing that because that's something that obviously we're we're working with in relation to the projects we're doing in Somerset in this particular yeah. time where we have to really rethink how do you make work outdoors safely, and and do you want to make work outdoors in that particular way either. Mm. Um, sorry, back over to you, Noel. Um, did you say time? Were you mentioning time? Sorry, as been... yes, I was just mentioning time. Um, it was until three o'clock. Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I can see. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I think it's maybe we just wrap it up and. Yeah. and um, uh, we say thank you to Gordon for sharing an amazing project. Um, I'm so glad I heard more of it. I mean, I knew quite a bit about it, but uh, it's it's so great to hear you talking as well of, about. They, I don't know. There's a real sense of um, um, you know articulation of 
quite elaborate ideas um, and they resonate with so many of our practices as we do faculty. So it's, it's um, thank you very much for that. Yeah. And I hope it would be lovely to hear other people's work online if we yeah, yeah exactly so i was say i was say i was going to say that that it might be a format that we continue um to to propose to offer um over the summer or i i, I don't know um as a kind of conversation between us um that we might record like we just did today um on on um exchange of ideas exchange of practices um yeah, would that be something that people want to do? Can I just make a little recommendation? It's a temp. It's a it's a really um, short period. There's um, we have um, we have a movie subscription going through the university. It's totally unrelated to anything that we discuss, except for the John Berger reference that Gordon has given. Um, so on, we get the university subscription to movie. And there's a film on at the moment um, about John Berger, which I watched yesterday and really enjoyed. So if anyone wants to, I think Tilda Swinton's involved and a couple of other. Um, it's a really nice sort of later life um, bunch of interviews and things. So uh, if you want to get on movie and you can get a university login, and just watch it. It's, it's there for a limited time. Yeah. I think it's called Four Seasons in... Quince, Quincy, Four Seasons in yeah, exactly. Q, Q U I N C Y. Noel, how do you pronounce that? Four Seasons <laughs> in Quincy. Yeah. But uh, where, where can we find? Is it on the library catalog? Yes, if, uh, it's it's pretty. It's been pretty quiet, but we have. Um, you can log into Movie through the library catalog, and they have really nice um, films on there. Okay. Yeah, great. No, thank you, Tom. That's great. Yeah, it's very good to know. Uh, I didn't even know it existed. So, uh, yep. In case you need some amusement during your uh, lockdown, and um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Gordon. It's been brilliant. Thank you for organizing. Yeah, great. No, thank you very much. Um, I hope we can, like I said, continue um, doing something. So please send me an email if you want to um, be in conversation with us next time. Um, it's it's I think it's you know it's all about us isn't it you know how active we are or how how much we want to exchange and things and I think it's quite nice that it's uh, kind of informal or if you know if you want to invite someone in conversation with you as well like we've done in the past um, but it's um, so it can take different different um, formats but I like the informality of exchanging you know just like what you just did Tom as well it's like we you know we don't have the corridor. Um, conversation anymore, so that's quite nice to to have something that has a bit of structure, a bit of focus, but can also um, allow for um, informal conversation. Um, and I think we did a bit of that today. So um, thank you, thank you, everybody, everyone. Um, I think it's Friday, three thirty. So um, I don't have the gin tonic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wish that we can have a really good restful uh, weekend and when it comes. And um, yeah, I think it's the end of term, isn't it, for us as well, a little bit. Like I, I have that in my diary somehow, and I don't really know what it, <laughs> what, what, when it comes, when it finishes, when it ends. But I, is it the end of term? Is it the end of assessment? What, what's the end of? I don't know. <laughs> it's never going to happen. You can officially make it that if you wish, I think. Yeah. <laughs> not, the, not the end of assessment for me, I'm afraid. Loads more. I don't think we get more things in. I think now we've got to mark, but I don't think we're getting more things yeah. in. I don't um, All right. Okay. Guys, bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, love.